Hey everyone, welcome back to the Got Fishing Podcast. Really appreciate everybody tuning in and we have a really great podcast for you today. And, and as always, you know, to help us grow, if you find this podcast interesting or you think one of your buddies would, would enjoy it, please share it with them and also subscribe. We'd really appreciate it. Like with our theme this year, we're trying to bring some unique podcasts, something that's slightly different than what you hear on a, on a standard fishing podcast. So if you've been listening to the last ones, the last three or four, they've been just a little bit left of center as far as what you would normally be hearing on a fishing podcast. And we're trying to with this podcast, bring you another unique perspective. And we have a really awesome guest that I was lucky enough to meet through the Mayfly Project. And all of you know about my involvement in the Mayfly Project and what a what a unique organization that is. And through that organization, I ended up meeting Wayne Walkenin. And uh, I'd like to introduce Wayne as our guest today. Wayne is a biologist, in, is a wildlife biologist in Idaho. And I'm going to let him kind of introduce himself as far as what he's been doing in that arena. Um, but Wayne, thanks for joining us and welcome to the Got Fish podcast. Um, yeah, thanks, Brian. Glad to glad to join you. Um, yeah, as you said, my name's Wayne Walken and I'm, I'm now a retired biologist. <laughs> yeah. So I have a lot more time for fishing. But uh, yeah, I was a uh, wildlife research biologist up in uh, living in Bonners Ferry. Um, working on both grizzly bears and uh, woodland caribou up there. I, I was spent about 25 years up there. Originally started in 1990, um, worked for about 25 years. And then the last five years of my career, I was in Coeur d'Alene here as the regional uh, wildlife manager. That's amazing. You know, when, when, when you and I were talking at uh, one of the projects this summer up in Coeur d'Alene and I found out about um, you know, what you did um, for your career. You know, my dad was a fishing game uh, commissioner over in, in uh, Montana for eight years. And so I was, I, I got to be heavily involved in the wolf reintroduction. And then of course, you know, because of his connections, I, I was involved in, um, you know, just hearing a lot about the grizzly bear reintroduction and some of the impacts that it's had on Montana that, and the sportsmen, et cetera, et cetera. And so when, when you and I were talking, um, I thought, wow, you know, how cool would it be to have you on the podcast to, to really shed some light on what we have seen with grizzly bears really over the last decade. And I'm sure that it's been going on longer than that. But, you know, as far as like my recreation in the outdoors, both in Idaho and Montana, uh, growing up, you know, there were some places that you went, such as Glacier National Park, where you needed to be uh, aware of grizzly bear and grizzly bear activities. But there were many areas that we hiked, you know, without a firearm, without without bear spray, without really any concern of grizzly bears, where today that's that is not the case. You know, things have dramatically, you know, changed. And when you got started in this, there was we were they were endangered. We were trying to re get grizzly bears back. And now, you know, with the conversation you and I were having, it kind of went from, you know, trying to get the, re the grizzly bears reintroduced. Um, to managing them now, which is kind of a Cadillac problem to have. So I thought it would be interesting for our, our sportsmen and outdoorsmen to kind of hear the evolution of the grizzly bear and kind of how this whole thing has come to be from an endangered species in many areas in Idaho and Montana to now where, I, last I heard, Montana currently has somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 grizzly bears. Could be a few more, could be a few less. So obviously there's a lot of bears out there. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about like how you got involved in this from the beginning and, and where things were at when you got started. Because back in the day, it was, they were endangered. Right. Um, yeah, I, I kind of had an interesting start. I actually did my uh, my master's in southern Idaho on sage grouse. So a uh, little bit of a different start than some yeah. maybe. But I, I was working in uh, in the Idaho Falls area for Idaho Fishing Game as a as a habitat technician, and I got a call one day from the from the Wildlife Bureau chief, and and he said, "Hey, how would you like to go to Bonners Ferry and work on grizzly bears?" And it's like, "Well, sure, you know, I'll probably have to change my capture techniques a little bit from <laughs> from sage grass to to grizzly bears, but yeah, yeah. so yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I I moved up there in 1990." and started and uh and at the time it really was um there weren't very many bears around um research 
on grizzly bears hadn't started that much prior to that. I think in, you know, there were always historically grizzly bears in the Selkirks. Um, but there were, there at, at the time, there was, in, say, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was even a question of, are there any grizzly bears left in Idaho in the Selkirks? Um, and I think the first bear was captured in, uh, first grizzly bear was captured in the Selkirks in 1983. Three, I think I might have those dates a little bit off, but that was the first really concrete confirmation that there indeed are still grizzly bears in the Selkirks. Um, you know, I like to say I showed up in 1990 and, uh, at that point we were really still very much, um, in the bear recovery mode. There were very few bears around and, uh, our, our big focus at the time was, trapping, trying to trap and put radio collars on grizzly bears just so we could learn some very basic things about them, have seasonal habitat use. And, and uh, we weren't even worried about getting numbers at that point in time. It's just like, are they still here and how many and, and you know, reproductive status and, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, I, I, that, I said I started in 1990 um, and then there were steps, land management agencies and hunter education and, and a lot of steps in grizzly bear recovery. But through the years, we did see um, an increasing grizzly bear population. Um, and, and one of the things about working on something like grizzly bears is you have to be pretty patient because their reproductive output is so slow. It's not like a white-tailed deer population that's going to you know bounce back after a bad winter. It's a slow process for for grizzly bears, but uh, but through you know changes like I say in some land management, um, road management specifically, and some sanitation requirements and and uh, hunter education of mistaken identity and and some some criminal prosecution of poaching, um, mm-hmm. we saw recovery of bears. Um, like I say, slow, but we saw recovery and. And, you know, 25 years later, when I when I left Bonners Ferry, we'd really sh- finally shifted from just a pure recovery situation of trying to grow more bears. And we, it, we did that. We had increasing population. We also had increasing distribution, which created some of the problems that you were talking about with grizzly bears is, is – during the void, like say specifically in the Priest Lake area, during the void of grizzly bears, humans came in and of course there's a cabin sites and everybody has their barbecue on the back deck and they're feeding <laughs> feeding birds with black sunflower seeds and that sort of stuff. That kind of stuff doesn't go well with grizzly bear management. So so we moved kind of from a peer recovery thing to um, we got to a point where it's really a bear management um, situation now where they're not a recovered population yet. There's still not a lot of bears in the Selkirks, but certainly more than there were. And now we're dealing with um, bear human interactions, um, not only from a hunter standpoint, but huckleberry pickers and summer recreation users and and sanitation and backyard bird feeders and and the whole gamut. So, you know, it it, it was uh, rewarding to be associated with a project long enough to to see something like concrete evidence of of success if you will as far as recovering grizzly bears um but it came with its own challenges um and specifically for grizzly bears a lot of it is is the is the bear human interaction so so yeah. so back in the um like you said 83 84 is possibly when the first uh grizzly bear was captured you came on in the 90s I, I know there's no um, exact number of data on, on how many grizzly bears were there. Is there any today? I mean, from, from, from 84 to 2024, how many, what kind of recovery are we looking at? Have we gone from 10 bears to a hundred or give us an idea? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a hard question to answer. Part of it, you have to, you have to define what do you call in the Selkirks because the Selkirk range is continuous up into British Columbia. Right. And actually the, the Selkirk recovery zone includes portions of British Columbia, which is the, the only one that, that does. 
So when you say how many bears are in the Selkirks, it's like, well, how many bears in what part of the Selkirks? The right. U.S. part, the B.C. part, the two together. So it, it's a little bit hard to tease out. And also the level of research, um, you know, we've done a lot more research on the U.S. side of the border than the B.C. folks have. So we maybe have a better handle. But but anyway, to try to to try to ballpark an answer is when we started research, there were a handful of bears. 10 or less probably total. Yeah. Um, in the U.S. portion, there were probably more bears in B.C. at the time. Um, a, a best guess I can give you right now, and, and it's, you know, it's an educated best guess, but it's still a best guess would be maybe in the ballpark of 75 bears, give or take, in the Selkirk ecosystem. So not huge numbers yet. Um, but certainly better than it was when I started. You mentioned a few key things like um, um, sanitation and uh, hunter education, um, you know, being able to better identify the difference between a black bear and a grizzly bear. What would you say has had the biggest impact, you know, over the 20, 25 years that you've been involved that have helped take the bear from five to 10 to, to 75 potentially? Or has it just been a, a little bit of everything? I think you yeah, it was a little bit of everything, but I think it's it was probably two things that are most important. One was um, road density management. Uh, it's it's almost all Forest Service ownership there. It's some Idaho Department of Lands or some private in holdings, but it's almost all Forest Service ownership. And um, by reducing open road densities, so roads that you can drive your truck up, it just yeah. Um, eliminated or reduced the interaction of people with bears. Um, it gave bears a little bit more free roam, free space to roam. Um, and a big thing when when they first started, um, the biggest factor on grizzly bear um, population dynamics was human caused mortality, and it was specifically hunters killing grizzly bears. Um, and so by reducing road densities, one you just reduce that opportunity for somebody to drive up roads and see a bear out in the woods and shoot it. Um, whether it was intentional poaching or whether it was mistaken identity, it still resulted in a dead bear. So um, road density management was a, was a huge thing. That was really probably the, the single biggest factor. The second one was just education um, of the public about the presence of grizzly bears. Um, and initially, certainly education of hunters that there are grizzly bears in the area and you need to, you know, you need to tell the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear. And, and uh, we went to the point of hiring, there are, you know, conservation officers working in the area just as standard protocol for fishing game. But, but we ended up hiring a conservation officer that was specifically dedicated to grizzly bear education and enforcement efforts. And uh, he spent a lot of time talking to sportsman's group and writing articles and, and, you know, all just contacting hunters out in the woods, whether it's the spring bear season or the fall, fall bear season, black bear season, just making people aware of the presence of grizzly bears in there and, and you know, the, the need to, to identify, know how to identify one or the other. Um, so I think those two things were probably the biggest factors. I think as bear populations expanded, um, then we kind of shifted a lot more into sanitation education. This is how you properly store your garbage. And no, you probably shouldn't feed 50 pound bags of black sunflower seeds all yeah. the time because bears love sunflower seeds. And so it was, you know, the, the road density was first, the, the, education specifically hunter education was a big one and and then i think the sanitation because well, I like i said when it started the the big thing was human caused mortality and if we didn't reduce the human caused mortality bears were not going to recover i know it was a big deal in montana like when you mentioned you know just just not not only identifying being able to, for the hunters to be able to identify the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear but a lot of hunters that had um quote unquote accidentally killed a grizzly bear were claiming they had no idea there was even grizzly bears in the area you know that, that it wasn't um i didn't need to identify it because i just thought it was a black bear there's no grizzly bears in the area and so i think part of it was just educating these the hunters that 
yes, today there's a good chance that it could be a grizzly bear and you do need to pump the brakes and, and make sure that what you're shooting at or what you're about to harvest is a black bear and not a endangered grizzly bear. Right. Yep. Same, same thing for the Selkirks. Um, you know, and, and I think that's also now expanded in Northern Idaho. Um, at the start, it was only unit one. You know, unit one was really the only hunting unit where you ever found grizzly bears. <laughs> now that's not the case. Unit one and two and three and four. And, you know, so it, it, it just ex it represents the expansion of the population is that now it's just not the Selkirks where you have the potential to run into a grizzly bear. We we had a, you know, a grizzly bear killed up the North Fork of the Coeur d'Alene, not very far from where we were fishing with the Mayfly kids. Yeah. Um, a few years back. So well, how is yeah, it? it's, it's human interaction. Pardon? How is it killed? Human interaction? Uh, that was an illegal bait, um, black bear hunter using uh, illegal bait. Uh, baits legal in unit four, but there were other circumstances. But uh, yeah, mistaken identity. He, he thought he was killing a black bear. It is hard to believe when you see the two side by side. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of people claim that they were seeing a wolf when, you know, uh, prior to wolves being introduced when, when really it was a coyote. When you see them side by side, you're like, well, it's, it's, uh, but I guess from a distance and if you just don't know, um, you don't know, but that'd be like, uh, a mule deer hunter shooting a whitetail and, and being, and claiming, you know, it just, it, I thought it was a mule deer, but. Anyway, I, I do believe right. that there, there has been some cases where it was real, um, but I think that there's been obviously some cases where um, just carelessness um, was was really the cause of, of the bear dying instead of, um, you know, proper identification and using your head because they, they don't necessarily look the same. But one of the things that I wanted to yeah. talk about was, you know, obviously Montana and Idaho are, are, are you know, different sizes in land mass, but where the grizzly bears hang out, you know, in Montana is obviously the third of the state in large part. They are, they are expanding Missouri breaks and, you know, we're, we're starting to see them in the prairies and the flatlands as well. But when you look at the population, like you're saying, you know, about maybe, maybe 60 to 80, maybe 75 are sitting in the Selkirks. We also have the Frank Church Wilderness, which is the largest wilderness in the lower 48. And then over in Montana, we have the Bob Marshall Wilderness. My dad and I, gosh, you know, I, I don't remember how long ago this was, but it had to have been 15 years ago, maybe longer. We did a hike across the Bob Marshall. And at that time, we were um, noticing, and I think we also ran into a fishing game person that was pulling some samples off bob wire. You know, they were wrapping bob wire around different trees to, to, to yep. the hair and then identify the DNA. And they were shocked. At, when they went to pick up the samples, instead of, you know, 10 or 15, 20 bears in the area, there was a couple hundred, you know, there was, it wasn't um, like just a few more than what they thought. It was substantially more. One of the questions that I have is why do you think that the grizzly bears are, are, are doing so well in rebounding an area like the Bob Marshall Wilderness? And we're not seeing that over in Idaho, say in the Frank Church or the Selkirks. When we have just as much land mass or more. Right. Well, I think, you know, specifically the Frank Church, there were once grizzly bears there, of course. Um, and uh, they, they were eliminated. Um, and I think, you know, if, we're, if you want to talk about, say, compare wolves with, with grizzly bears as far as the potential for recovery, wolves are great travelers. You know, they can get up and go for a walk about of a hundred miles and it's not really that big of a deal to them. So they're good at recolonizing areas. Grizzly bears are not, they don't travel that far. They don't, you know, they have a fairly good size home range. Like an adult male might, might have a 400 square mile home range, but they're really not good migrators, not good travelers. They, they tend to slowly build a population out from the core so once you eliminated bears from the bitterroots, um, there really wasn't, you know, especially you think about, say, the, the situation of grizzly bears in the, in, even in Montana in the 60s and 70s, there was no close population 
that would supply bears for the bitterets through a, through a natural process. They just don't travel that well. Okay. Um, wolves, wolves would, grizzly bears do not. Um, and in those intervening years, uh, you know, you think about human, human densities in the bitterate valley type stuff. Bears aren't going to cross that. <laughs> There's just too many people there to 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 think that you could have natural recolonization of bears in an isolated area like the Frank Church. Right. Um, you know, if you want to have bears there, you're gonna you're gonna have to probably do it um, through inter- reintroductions. Right. Um, and and so that's a huge thing about why you're not seeing population recovery in the bitterets. Um, you know, another one I think is is there's just a certain carrying capacity of the land. Um, the Selkirks are it's very good bear habitat. It's got great huckleberries. It's got you know good forage base, but it's physically not that big of an area when you compare it to say the the northern continental Vitica system as far as as grizzly bears. And you kind of look at the Selkirks, it's a, it's kind of this little finger mountain range that sticks down into Idaho from, from British Columbia. You've got the Kootenai River on one side, you've got Priest Lake drainage on the other side, which are full of people right now. So it naturally just constricts, I think, the ability of grizzly bears to continue to, to grow and expand. Um, I say that's why we're having uh, the, the the focus now on on bear human interactions as far as grizzly bear recovery in the Selkirks. It's just a human density thing, so it, it's probably just self limiting just by the amount of good available habitat. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. And, and what one of the? I guess another thing. Oh, another thing to throw in real quick as far as the the Frank Church is. Um, there's some, you know, past historical evidence that bears were um, pretty reliant on the salmon and steelhead runs that uh, that historically existed there, and those densities are far depleted now relative to right. historic right. numbers. So that, yeah, that super rich resource of nutrients in the fall to lay on all that fat to go into winter, and which has a huge impact on female reproductivity too that resource is gone. So, you know, I, I don't think uh, if bears get reestablished in the bitterets, they will not exist at the densities that they historically did just because the, that really valuable resource is not there. At what level did the dams affect that? I mean, it, it sounds like it would have, it had a huge impact on it, right? The, the lower snake river dams. Yeah. And that's what's prevented oh, the oh, yeah. from continuing up. So this doesn't just not you know, affect we, salmon and steelhead populations, but but essentially to some degree, like in the Frank Church, maybe it was affecting the grizzly bear population. Right. Yeah, I think it's not. You know, we could we could delve into some pretty serious political arguments and stuff as far as dam removal, but but yeah, I think you're right. It's it's not just steelhead and salmon it's other animals black bears as well as grizzly bears but but and there's also some evidence that um that the nutrients supplied by the the salmon and steelhead affected um forest growth to a degree because it's that's a lot of a lot yeah. of nutrients that right. that were decaying in the system and then whether bears foraged those and brought them out but uh, they they provided nutrients for for a lot of other animals and not, you know, just thinking about steelhead and salmon numbers themselves. They talk a lot about that up in Alaska and British Columbia and the impacts that it has on the on the surrounding environment. So, yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree that obviously we don't have it anymore. It's it's going to have a negative impact. One, one of the questions that I had, and this this it kind of has to do with the expansion of, of the grizzly bears and now seeing them in areas that we didn't necessarily used to see them. You mentioned that a male grizzly bear has, you know, a range of potentially 400 square miles, but like, like wolves, you know, wolves self-manage their pack. They'll allow themselves to go to a certain size and then they'll kick out members. And those members obviously go over to the next drainage and, and create their own packs. And that's how we're seeing these expansion of the packs in these different areas. And like you say, the pro- prolific travelers. So we do have them in the Bob Marshall and the Frank Church and the Selkirks and, and all over. But as as the population in the Selkirks and as the population, say, in, in the um, 
Bob Marshall, the two areas that we're talking about, as they begin to expand, what is allowed by a grizzly bear? How many other bears are allowed within that territory? Because that's what's kind of causing a lot of these bears to be pushed out into the the flatlands and back into the Missouri breaks. And some of these areas that we haven't seen them in is because they're no longer allowed, I guess, quote unquote, allowed to stay in the area that they were in. They're being kicked out. Yeah, and I think to a degree that happens with grizzly bears as well. It's just that for a couple of huge differences, wolves' reproductive output, you know, is is they they can produce a lot of pups, and therefore they have the potential for a lot of uh, high population growth. Grizzly bears are very very slow at that. So even under good circumstances, you know, if you see a, a grizzly bear population increasing at two or three percent per year, you're doing pretty good. Um, so, you you know, I think we are seeing some of that same stuff, the, the, the expansion of grizzly bears because of whatever the, the critical density is that they'll tolerate. Um, it, it's I think it's some social spacing. It's also just purely some some resource availability is is bears will move out. It just doesn't happen nearly as fast as, as wolves. Um, I think it's also with, it kind of works the same way with wolves, but, but with grizzly bears, um, maybe even more so is the, the female offspring tend to stick around mom's home range. So you'll, you'll have, mom will have a home range of, of ballpark a hundred square miles, say. Um, her offspring, her female offspring, will generally kind of stick right around where she does. The the male offspring are the ones that will will travel. Um, but of course, if you only have males getting kicked out to these other areas, you're not going to get any reproduction. Right, there's no females. <laughs> only males are there. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right. You know, we we've had some. I know there was a bear that was killed down in uh, Kelly Creek. Um, that through some DNA stuff, they uh, we, we didn't have a radio collar on the bear. It was a young male. I think it was a maybe a four year old male, if I remember right. But um, it was a bear that ended up in Kelly Creek. It was killed, mistaken identity by a black bear hunter down there. That you know, again, it, it was a it was a guided hunt, and the the hunters like I had no idea there were grizzly bears here. That was a bear that. We don't know how it got from the Selkirks to Kelly Creek, but it somehow got there. Um, so they have limited ability to to travel and expand, but not nearly um, like, say, a wolf population will. Well, and, and again, it's just such a slow process. Where there's one, there's more, right? So that that's always a kind of a good <laughs> sign when you find those things. Well, because, that is true. You know, there's probably there probably is more that have found their way there. Um, and, and hopefully it's not just a, an anomaly. Well, right. one of the things I also wanted to talk about that, that we've touched on a little bit is, you know, the human interaction with grizzly bears. You know, we, we are seeing it more and more. And I think kind of like back to what we were talking about with hunter education, you know, educating hunters that there are grizzly bears in the area. And here's some of the things that you can be doing. Um, what? I'd love to hear from you some of the things that maybe that you've seen or some of the suggestions that you can make to people, you know, just like one of my home waters here in Montana, the Blackfoot River. Growing up, we rafted it, we, we you know, swam in it, we fished in it, I'm never, ever a concern of a grizzly bear. And today, you would not go fish that river, swim that river, be even around that river without some form of protection, you know, especially in the springtime um, with, with moms and their cubs. There's many, many stories today of, you know, charges and people seeing bears out on the river. So today it's very real. You know, we're, we're seeing it um, and it's it's not occasionally. It's fairly consistent now where, where humans are interacting with bears. What are, what are some suggestions that you can give to people, you know, knowing bears, knowing them at a different level than we do? How How is how minus the bear sprays and the firearms, what are some other things that we can be doing to interact, continue to stay out there fishing and enjoying the environment? But, you know, as as these things, as, as things get better in the bear world, we're going to have more and more of these occasions where we're we're running into them. So what can we be doing as outdoorsmen to 
make it a better place for both us and them. Right. You know, I think, I think far and away, the biggest um, thing is sanitation, food storage at campgrounds, garbage cans around your house. Um, I've mentioned black sunflower seeds before Um, barbecue, just compost piles. One of the things about grizzly bears, they're, they have a very wide ecological niche. They can live just about anywhere and they have a very wide variable diet. They can, they'll eat just about anything. So the, the sanitation, the food storage, that type of stuff is really important. You know, grizzly bears are not aggressive predators. They're not hiding behind trees, waiting to jump on you or anything. They're just out there trying to make a living. If you're yeah. going to give them an easy living of open trash cans, they're going to take advantage of that. Um, you know, if you leave your cooler out on the picnic table all night long and it's got ham in it, they're going to take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's the far and away the biggest thing is just the, the whole food storage sanitation issue. Um, there's always, you know, the, 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 female with cubs type thing and, and, and surprise encounters like that. One of the things fishermen, I think, have an advantage over, over hunters as far as encounters with bears is, you know, hunters are out there trying to be stealthy specifically, especially yeah. bow hunters. I mean, that's the game is you're stealthy and you're quiet. And, and, and yeah. so you may be close to a bear and not know it until it's, until it's too late. Fishermen, we don't have to be quiet. You know, you could you could make a little bit of noise, and and uh, if if a bear is around outside of a food conditioned bear, like I say, if a food conditioned bear is a whole different situation. But if if it's just a bear out, it doesn't matter whether it's a black bear or grizzly bear. If there's a bear out in the woods, they would rather not interact with us. They're they're naturally wary of us. Um, and if they know you're coming, they might be around the next bend, and by the time you get there, they're gone. Um, so, you know, that's just one of the things, all that being said, I think it is, um, important, uh, as you said, to be ready for encounters by, by pepper spray par- primarily. Um, that's, I think it, I carry it with me now, most places I go. Um, and it also, it also works well for things like belligerent moose, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which, right, right. It's a real problem, you know, right? it, yeah. You know, I, I used to get, when I worked up in Bonners Ferry, I would get calls from people that, uh, that were concerned about going out uh, camping in the, in the Selkirks, um, hiking in the Selkirks, you know, and I said, well, first of all, let's, let's put it all in perspective. As far as my perspective, when, when I'm out in the woods, whether I'm working specifically going, you know, into grizzly bear, habitat looking for for bear stuff or whether i'm just hiking and recreating my number one concern about my health are other people humans right. are far more dangerous than bears or moose or mountain lions you know so other people number two is probably moose i've been charged by moose more times than i've been charged by black bears or grizzly bears you know number three is probably mountain lions you know, now number four, we might be getting down to grizzly bears, but, but there are other things that I was much more concerned about as far as my safety than, than grizzly bears. So we have to remember to put it in perspective. Probably the most dangerous thing you're going to do when you, when you go somewhere is to drive on the highway to get to the trailhead. <laughs> That's yeah. probably far more dangerous than what you're going to run into out in the woods. So yeah, it's it's a changing landscape. There's no question that there is a difference when you recreate in an area that has grizzly bears versus one that, that does not have grizzly bears. Right. Um, but to remember to keep it in perspective. It's not like you have to fear for your life when you're out there all the time. And, and you know, sanitation and just being aware of your surroundings. I mean, if you if you come upon a dead mule deer that's been stashed in a pile there's a predator around somewhere and you probably should leave the area so it's it's just awareness of the area as well 
part of it um, is we all grew up in this area largely in the absence of grizzly bears, and we kind of got spoiled. We could leave our cooler out on the picnic table at night. You know, you can't do it anymore. So so we had the luxury, if you want to call it that, of, of recreating in the area without grizzly bears. Um, now I think we have the privilege of recreating in an area with grizzly bears. I think it's, I think it's kind of cool, to be honest. Um, it well, adds another neat dimension out there. But it comes with awareness. I think that's a great segue to a, to a question that I have. You know, it, you now it, it's a great privilege now. I think a lot of people ask themselves, you know, and and maybe as they listen to this, are asking themselves, why are we trying to recover the grizzly bear? I mean, if, if we got rid of them, the, what what value, what benefit? And I, obviously, this is a discussion that happens in the world of the wolves all the time. But today we're talking about grizzly bears and reintroduction, and and um, so why? Uh, from from your perspective, to answer that question for someone who comes up and says, "Why are we trying to improve and and put more bears um, where we where we could potentially have these these issues?" Right. Yeah, it, and that's that's a very good question to ask. And and I think if you go all the way back to the to the Endangered Species Act when that was that legislation was first written, that was a conscious decision by the nation at the time that animals like grizzly bears are valuable to have around. So it it really does go back to putting a philosophical value on a complete ecosystem, whether you're talking about grizzly bears or wolverine or lynx or bald eagles or osprey or, you know, could go on and on. Um, there's value in there there's value in having a complete ecosystem if it still functions the way it did that's a good healthy sign for our environment um and if you start to me if you start writing off it's like yeah grizzly bears are kind of inconvenient to have around so let's not worry about them and yeah wolves are kind of a pain in the butt so let's not worry about them and you know, bald eagles, they're kind of cool, but we don't need them either. So we can do some, well, I'll spray, you know, where do you stop? I mean, it, it, it's just, I, I think it was just a decision by the nation at the time that animals like grizzly bears are valuable to have around. And will the Bitterroot ecosystem, um, will the Frank Church function fine without grizzly bears? Well, yeah, it has for a lot of years. Yeah that doesn't mean it's a complete ecosystem right at least in my view well i think for those of us that enjoy the outdoors like truly truly enjoy the outdoors and and recreate in the outdoors um and vacation in the outdoors i think many of us do you know truly want a, a a complete ecosystem um obviously nobody wants to be running into trouble or you know having their kid eating on the trailhead or something like that but at the end of the day, I think so much of this comes back to, you know, we don't want to get too far away from like what you what you what you were saying. You know, where 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 is the line in the sand where we we stop caring? Like, we have dams now, we have salmon issues, steelhead issues, which are potentially causing bear issues. Which you know, it just goes on and on and on. And if we don't, um, you know, have a little bit more be a little bit more responsible in some of these areas, yeah, all of a sudden, what what is going out into the wilderness look like? A part of going out into the wilderness is that excitement. It is that kind of there's a little bit of fear. There's a little bit of stepping outside of your comfort zone. And if everything's comfortable, you're no longer stepping out of your comfort zone. And those things aren't as attractive and aren't as much fun. Um, it's, not, it's not adventuring anymore. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of aspects to to it that people don't necessarily look at. And so much of it um, that we see today, whether it's... Um, misidentifying or not using proper sanitation or going hiking in the back country and just using, you know, it, not using proper, um, uh, oh, just proper keeping your food down the trail, you know, a couple or up in the tree. It all, all comes back down to common sense. I mean, it really does. Most of these instances, instances that you see, Instagram is filled with them, you know, people interacting with moose and elk and bison <laughs> there and, uh, you know, over at Yellowstone, it's just lack of common sense. And so I do believe that 
we need to manage these things, obviously, like wolves. And, and you know, we're getting to a place in Montana where grizzly bears and hunting seasons are being discussed and stuff. Obviously, that's a good sign. A lot of people are like, now we're hunting grizzly bears? Like, yes. That, if we're now at a place where we're, we're starting to hunt them as a form of management, that's a really good thing. Um, and it means that we're at a place in some of these areas where it has grown to, uh, you know, a recovered state. Uh, quote unquote. So right. I think that uh, people just needing to kind of understand the other side of the coin, you know, why we're reintroducing wolves, why we're reintroducing grizzly bears or why there's this, um, uh, why money or time and energy is being spent on keeping a predator or keeping something like this around. And so I really appreciated your explanation on that because I totally agree. I think too, that, that, Humans have a do a poor job of putting things in historical perspective because because bears weren't here for fifty years. It's like yeah, but what about the previous five thousand or ten thousand years or whatever? Right. You know, our, our window is extremely extremely small when it comes to a historical perspective, and it's like yeah, we don't you know. 20 years ago, we didn't have them. We don't need them now. It's like, yeah, 100 years ago and 500 years ago and 1,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago, they were plentiful and they were healthy. And, and we kind of, things are, are, are our historical window is skinny. Yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. stop this. You're right. Everything is going to disappear. Um, and so one of the things I just wanted to kind of as a, as a, as a side topic to our topic, um, I think it's kind of segues nicely to this is, is the uh, Selkirk caribou that when you, when you went over there in the nineties, there was a, a herd, I'll probably butcher this, but I believe a herd that resided in the United States um, on a fairly consistent basis of about 50 to 60 caribou. Is that fair? <laughs> Well, depends on when you ask. It kind of like grizzly bear stuff. Depends right. on when you ask the question. At the time of listing um, of woodland caribou and the nomenclature, it gets a little different. Woodland caribou versus barren ground caribou. Um, we had woodland caribou, also known as mountain caribou, and that confuses things. But at the time, there were probably 10 to 15 caribou in the Selkirk ecosystem um, that came down into the U.S. portion of the Selkirks. Okay. Okay. Um, and be, because of those low numbers, it was listed as an endangered species. Um, and the idle fishing game in, um, I think it was 87, 88, and 1990, uh, went up to British Columbia and captured 60 woodland caribou and brought them down and released them into the into the idle portion of the Selkirks. Right. Um, like I say, that was 87, 88, 90. And then about 10 years later, uh, the state of Washington did the same thing uh, with a total of four to 43 caribou that they, they went up and, and captured and brought back to the United States, down to the United States and released them. Um, so 103 caribou were reintroduced into the Selkirk ecosystem, um, partly by idle fishing game, partly by Washington Department. Um, but at the most, and I did uh, annual surveys. We did a, a this combination fixed wing helicopter surveys in the Selkirks. We did it every year in the winter, usually um, February, March is when we did the survey. And, and it was... It was pretty much a, as close to a total census as we can get, just a total count of the animals. Um, but it it peaked out at right around fifty animals. Um, they, you know, it, you say, "Well, wait a minute, you brought in a hundred and three animals, and yeah. and it peaked out at 50. It's like the math doesn't work out. Well, of course, when you bring animals in or introduction, you're gonna you're gonna lose some. There's no question about that. And as you know, they they are introduced into a whole new area they've never been in before, and you lose them to to accidents or predation or whatever. But the stable population, um, you know, was thirty, and it was kind of climbing and seemed to stabilize about fifty animals. Um, 
we had radio collars on a good number of those critters. And we tried to, um, as soon as we detected a mortality of a radio collared animal in, in the the collars have a motion sensor on them as soon as they they are not moving for a specific period of time and you could you can four hours or eight hours or twelve hours you can program that um it sends out a different signal and then we tried to get in on the caribou as as quickly as we can to try to determine cause of death um and when that first reintroduction happened, there were no wolves in the ecosystem at all. Um, they they weren't there. We had black bears, grizzly bears, um, and mountain lions. Um, and we found that the mortality was, the primary source of mortality of woodland caribou in the Selkirks was due to mountain lions. Mm-hmm. It wasn't grizzly bears. It wasn't black bears. It was mountain lions. Um, and even with the predation we saw, they were, you know, seemed to be somewhat stable at, at 50 animals, um, give or take. I mean, I think 53 might have been the highest highest that I ever counted. Um, but then as wolves got reestablished, I think it wasn't that wolves took over the world and killed all the caribou. I think that it was just that additive mortality of mountain lions and then wolves on top of it. And there were certainly some uh, some mortality due to due to grizzly bears and black bears as well um but it was mostly mountain lion mortality and then some additive wolf mortality on that and then the population just declined um and uh oh, 5 6 years ago now the the census stood at three animals i think and and the decision was made and and they were all in the bc portion of the ecosystem the uh, the decision was made with the BC folks that uh, they were going to go in and catch those three animals and take them up to some captive rearing facilities that they have um, closer to Revelstoke in uh, in BC. Um, as it turned out, all three of those animals were females, so there was no no reproductive potential there at all. And uh, they caught those three animals and then took them up into um, a captive rearing facility in in uh, further north in British Columbia, um, because it's not just woodland caribou that are in trouble in the Selkirks in the in the U.S. part of the ecosystem. They are endangered in all of British Columbia as well. So they're taking some fairly um, big measures in trying to recover um, woodland caribou populations up there. Um, so. I don't know if we'll get caribou back in the Selkirk, in the U.S. portion of the Selkirks in the future or not, but there are none there now. Yeah. And that was the last, uh, the only herd that we ever had in the United States and now, so we don't have any caribou in the U.S. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're, 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 the woodland caribou was distributed oh, kind oh, of oh. across the very northern tier of the U.S. They were in Montana. Um, they were in Idaho. They were in portions of Washington. And there were um, woodland caribou in Maine. They actually tried a reintroduction effort in Maine for a while. And uh, that was interesting because it, it looked like um, disease was the biggest factor that that reintroduction did not work, but it was it was meningeal brainworm carried by white-tailed deer that transferred to uh, woodland caribou, and they die from it. The, wood, the, the white-tailed do not, but but the caribou do, and it looked like it was a disease issue back in Maine. Um, but there were once caribou there, and and no longer caribou there either. So yeah, you know, it, it. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, that's. I think that's what makes your job so unique and so interesting is this balance act that, that nature has. Because on one hand, you know, we're trying to recover the grizzly bears, the wolves. Uh, there's obviously been, you know, there's a lot of um, groups out there that want to protect the mountain lions as well. And no trapping and no hunting with hounds and all of these different things while, you know, the cats continue to expand their territory and we have wolves moving in. So it's funny how... You know, on one hand, we're trying uh, and spending up millions and millions of dollars on getting our ecosystem balanced, but in balancing it, it also can cause some unbalance. And and a lot of these predators are what have caused the woodland caribou into extinction. The same animals that we're trying to bring back. 
Yeah, you know, that's that's a very interesting point. I think if you look historically in the Selkirks, as far as woodland caribou, wolves were there. It had to be. Historically, say it. Yeah. Yeah, at the turn of the century, there were more wolves than were there, say, in the in the 1990s. There were more grizzly bears than there were there in the 1990s. There were also caribou there, um, say, at the turn of the century. There were quite a few. Um, but, I, yeah, it's a good point as far as habitat changes. And I think in the Selkirks with caribou, a lot of it had to do with um, alternate prey densities, you look back at trapper journals or hunter journals in the 1900s, there were not very many deer in the Selkirks at all. Um, And I had one diary where they they said, yeah, we didn't kill a deer unless we really had to, because they kind of felt sorry for him because there wasn't very many around. And, you know, you look at whitetail density now in the Priest Lake Basin or in Bonners Ferry. I mean, we're issuing the fishing game is issuing extra doe tags to try to reduce densities of whitetails. And, you know, I think these these habitat changes that happened more widespread than just where grizzly bears or caribou were. But but these habitat changes have resulted in great whitetail densities, great whitetail hunting up in unit one. Um, yes. but when you change the, the density of the prey, you know, in this case, we're talking about white tailed deer that changes the density of predators that can carry, you can, you can support a whole lot more mountain lions than you yep. ever did before. Yep. Um, and that's what was causing then the predation problem with caribou were, were, were mountain lions. So yeah, it's kind of this, this juggling act to a degree. It's like, of course, hunters want a lot of white-tailed deer because they like to hunt them, but the consequence are higher densities of mountain lions and that impacted woodland caribou. So, right. Right. yeah, it's not a not an easy task. You can't keep everybody happy, basically. <laughs> well, and I think that's kind of one of the messages today, too, is to just, you know, inform people of, of, of a lot of the work that is being done that we don't necessarily see and that balancing our environment and balancing this, 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 I mean, we could have, we could have 10 podcasts, a hundred podcasts on appeasing, you know, all of the different people that are stepping into the wilderness today at the trailhead, because there's a lot of different flavors of individuals and, and, and how they're enjoying it, their perspective of how they should be enjoying it, what animals should be out there, shouldn't be out there, how you should be able to fish with what, I mean, it's, there's just so many different opinions out there. And, and also, you know, not everybody has the answer. So you try these different things and sometimes they become, sometimes they work perfectly and sometimes they become unbalanced. Um, but I really enjoy kind of just hearing your perspective um, of this and and also kind of getting an understanding of the grizzly bears and, and some of the, the um, in factors that came into play or that you guys brought into play, I guess would be the better way of saying it, that really had a huge impact on recovering them through education, um, you know, stopping or I guess shutting down a lot of these forest service roads that just kind of endlessly and aimlessly went all over the back country. Um, and I even noticed that. I noticed a lot more uh, throughout the years, a lot more gates, a lot more access being limited up there. And um, yeah, so it means you have to park your truck and get out on foot. But I, um, I like hearing the perspective, like this is why that was happening. It was to protect some of these corridors. And obviously, right. that just didn't impact the grizzly bears. That impacts uh, elk migration, mule deer migration, et cetera, et cetera, when they're not having to interact with humans and vehicles and four-wheelers, et cetera, et cetera. That's yep. going to improve things. Lynx and wolverine yeah, certainly impacted. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it was, you know, a, a wonderful, rewarding career. It wasn't always fun, like being the grizzly bear guy in Bonners Ferry. I was maybe not always the most popular person in town or caribou recovery, same thing. But, but uh, you know, I love the community. We raised our kids there and, and got to got to be a member of the community. I liked it. And I like say it didn't come without its challenges. But, yeah. I, uh, you know, I think it was, to me, it was time well spent. All cool things do, right? All cool things come with a few challenges. And so, um, 
I really appreciate everything that you've done. I really appreciate, you know, the people that are involved in the fishing game and that are, you know, the biologists, the the wardens, the the people that are out there, you know, truly doing their best um, to balance all of our recreational needs from archery to rifle to fly fishermen to conventional to hikers to to motorcyclists. And now we've got the new e-bike out there and everybody's trying to to balance that as well. So it's a constantly yep. evolving deal. Um, and I really uh, appreciate your perspective on this. Really appreciate you being on the show. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have you back because I'd like to I'd like to dive into some of these topics that we were talking about, such as, you know, the, some of the greater impacts that the salmon and steelhead and or the lack of the salmon and steelhead and some of the the obvious things that we see, but some of the not so obvious impacts that, that they've made. So I see us doing a couple more shows. Well, Wayne, I really appreciate this podcast. Uh, I've learned a ton. I really hope that our listeners have learned a lot. It's been really, really informative. Um, obviously, you had a very exciting career. And um, I bet you're glad that you got moved from sage grouse over to grizzly bears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Sage grouse aren't doing that great right now either. So, uh, both both species uh, require some attention. But yeah, yeah, no, I I have no no regrets about my uh, my move studying grizzly bears. It was, it was certainly, I think, a privilege to be able to work on an animal like that, and and very rewarding to to uh, maybe count some level of success throughout the throughout my time there. So yeah, it was it was a wonderful career. I don't think many people, like you were saying at the beginning, I don't think many people do get to dive into a project of this magnitude and have such a have, have such an issue, such a problem, five to seven bears in an area, and then to to grow it um, and improve it like you guys did. I'd be very proud of that if I were you. That's that's amazing. Well, there was a whole slew of people involved in it, so certainly not a not a one man effort. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very um, something I think I can feel good about. So thanks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, uh, you know, I appreciate everything that you did with the Mayfly Project as well this last year. You know, Wayne was our lead mentor. It takes a ton of work just, just making sure we've got cool places to go fishing and balancing the mentors and the kids and the activities and all of the stuff that we're going to be doing. I was overwhelmed with how well it was run and what an amazing job you did. Uh, I really, really was impressed with that. And um, yeah, but really excited about this upcoming year. I know that the lead's been passed on to a couple other people, but you crushed it. Um, what a great year that we had. And so I just wanted to, on our podcast to just thank you for, you know, not only the efforts that you've made um, for us in, 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 in our environment, um, but also just the impact that you're making uh, in kids' lives today. And I think that it's awesome and I can't have enough people like you in my life. So thank you for everything that you do. Well, thanks. Yeah. And thanks appreciate for being on the that. podcast. I really do appreciate yeah. it. And again, people that are listening, you know, I think this was a good one. And if you guys um, you wouldn't mind sharing it with your, with your outdoor uh, partners, that'd be awesome. And Wayne, thank you again for taking the time to come on. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. You bet. <laughs> Talk to you guys soon. Thank you very much for listening.